So this is the first webinar of the, this session, the first of this series. And we are starting with the Asia, Southeast Asia and China. So um, Southeast Asia is home, we know, to a rich uh, diversity of indigenous animal genetic resource, which is essential for food system sustainability, uh, food security and poverty alleviation for millions of people in the regions. And this, really carrying a lot of animals which are known for their adaptive trait, which include tolerance to disease, pest, heat, stress, uh, feed and water shortage, etc. And uh, it is good genetic resources to build on to ensure that we can ensure food security in the regions. And conservation of this irreplaceable genetic resource therefore becomes highly critical in Southeast Asia or in Asia in general, if we are to continue benefiting from this uh, rich diversity of animal genetic resources, especially in the face of climate change. And this could be achieved through an integrated approach which consider both in-situ and ex-situ uh, uh, conservation strategies. So this webinar is in fact preparatory to a regional web lab biobanking training that we are, will be planning, aiming to present and familiarize participants with the gene bank operations, crowd conservation and restorations of local poultry, cattle and pigs, genetic resources, using the stem cell technologies, what the CTLGH, Rosling Institute and ILRI has been working on and to contribute to strengthen capacity for conservation practices and sustainable use of local animal genetic resources. And this is to be done under the auspices of CTLGH and the different programs, different partners, institutions, and it will guide the biobanking program to really identify the key players and the species or breeds of interest to be able to design and plan effective regional Crow, uh, conservation for cattle, pig, and poultry genetic resources in the regions using the uh, uh, stem cells technologies. So for this uh, webinar, we have a speaker today, uh, John Bocha from FAO and uh, Fem from Cambodia. I think Prof. Cook from Vietnam may contribute by giving a few talk on the status of poultry uh, genetic resources in Vietnam. Then we have also John Hu from Rosling Institute, Tom Borden from Rosling Institute as well. So that we have a global approach on the conservations of animal genetic resources in our region. So Tom, uh, Paul, Paul Butcher from FAO is uh, an animal production officer and uh, has been working with FAO from around uh, 14 years, where he's supporting conservations of animal genetic resources. And he has also worked with the IEA, Divisions of Nuclear Techniques and uh, Food uh, and Agriculture at the headquarter of the International Atomic Energy. And the primary activity of his work is to support country to uh, implement a global plan of action for animal genetic resources with particular emphasis on conservations and uh, applications of biotechnologies. And this is the reason why Tom is, uh, was to join us. Unfortunately, she shared the presentation because there has been another emergency this afternoon but we are going to share the screen and to listen to you and uh, we listen all together what Storm has to discuss with us before we move to the next presenter. So allow me to move to um, the presentation. Uh, just a minute. Can you see Tom presentation? Hello. Sorry, Christian, now, who are you talking about now? Which are supposed to, no, this is supposed to be Paul. Paul. Yeah, you, you keep on saying Tom. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> <I> <laughs> the two names are so close. 
I'm trying to load his presentation. Okay. Just a minute for us to see. Sorry, one day, can you, do you have that presentation? Can you, are you able to load it? Um, did you sh share with me the presentation? I think uh, Paul share with us. Okay, let me check maybe if there are. Just um, no, it's not with in my inbox. I don't know. Let me just try to fix it. Christian, do you want Paul to share the their own screen so that they have control of the presentation? Yes, he will be able to share. Yeah, I think uh, just let them have access to, and then we. Yeah, can Paul. Uh, uh, Paul has uh, had an emergency just a few minutes ago. That's why he shared the presentation. But that's why I'm trying to load for us to have a look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. You have it? Yes, okay. now it's it's visible. Yeah. Good day, everyone. I'm yeah. Paul Gletcher from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in Wilmington. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on the new FAO guidance for the management of animal genetic resources. Why are animal genetic resources important? Well, livestock form an essential part of the biological basis for world food security. In addition, around 1 billion people rely directly on livestock for a major proportion of their livelihoods. A diverse resource base is critical to eradicate world hunger. Livestock genetic diversity allows for adaptation of populations to current and future environmental constraints, including both proposed by climate and changes in the production environment markets. Genetic diversity also provides the raw material for breeders to make genetic improvements. Therefore, this collection of livestock genetic diversity is international good, and there is a logical role for the UN in the form of ethnic to support global coordination. As far as the roles and responsibilities of FAO, in general, could, they can be described as collaborating with member countries to support country-driven efforts to implement the Global Plan of Action for Animal Genetic Resources. The Global Plan of Action is a policy document. It is the only internationally developed and adopted plan to improve the management of the world's animal genetic resources. It was endorsed by FAO members at their conference in 2007 and then reaffirmed in 2017. The Global Plan of Action contains 23 different strategic priorities for action, which aim to address current and future challenges to the livestock sector. These 23 priorities are assigned to four strategic priority areas, characterization, inventory, and monitoring, sustainable use and development, and conservation. These are all under umbrella of actions on policies, institutions, and capacity. For additional responsibilities, FAO oversees the monitoring of the status of the GPA implementation, reporting on this every five years. FAO also monitors the state of the animal genetic resources themselves based on data provided by countries. FAO also raises awareness and promotes animal genetic resources issues internationally. 
Jay also works to establish or strengthen international information sharing, research, and education. I'll give a more detailed example on information sharing through our tool DATIS, the Domestic Animal Diversity Information System. DATIS serves as an interface for the global database of livestock breeds, as you can see the URL above. It contains information on nearly 9,000 different breeds from 37 different species group of traditional livestock and poultry, as well as information on managed animals. DATIS allows countries to document the presence of livestock breeds and species and their wild relatives and to describe their characteristics. It serves as the Convention of Biological Diversity's clearinghouse mechanism for animal genetic resources, and it is also the source of data for sustainable development goal indicators 2.5.1b and 2.5.2, which address ex situ and in situ conservation respectively. This slide shows three different screenshots of data, including the homepage, an example of a breed data sheet, and a demonstration that data can be used to generate graphs and tables. FA also promotes international cooperation and develop partnerships among countries and non-state actors. We also help to build capacity within countries through training workshops organized either by FAO or by other stakeholders, such as the workshops that we are attending today. FAO provides technical support to country in a matter of different ways, including implementing and backstopping projects, development of international technical standards and protocols, and the preparation of technical guidance. Among the strategic priorities of the Global Plan of Action is to develop international technical standards and protocols. This is important because some countries may lack the knowledge or familiarity with the most effective and up-to-date methods and protocols for the management of animal genetic resources. Also, the application of standardized approaches facilitates information sharing, comparison, and evaluation of implementation across countries. Therefore, FAO has collaborated with experts from around the world to develop a collection of technical guidelines. This slide here shows an example of the 10 guidelines that we have developed in the past. They're split across the different strategic priority areas, as well as one guideline on national action plans, which covers all four. Most of these guidelines were developed soon after the adoption of the Global Plan of Action in 2007, but they remain fully applicable. However, in other instances, technology had advanced rapidly so that updating the guidelines has been warranted. For example, in cryoconservation, gene banking of livestock, genomics, reproductive physiology, and cryobiology are all important, and there have been major advances over the last 10 years or so. Also, more and more, we see a trend towards utilization of gene banking material for management of in situ populations, rather than the past trend of having gene banking mainly to support the reconstitution of the extinct breeds. There have also been great advances in molecular genetic char characterization, once again in genomics, as well as the analog methods to evaluate the data. Therefore, FAO has recently developed new guidelines on these topics. This slide shows the cover pages of these two new guidelines, which have been available online since mid-January. We are currently not intending to prepare hard copy versions. For some background on the Innovations in Cryoconservation Guideline from 2016 to 2020, FAO was a partner in the European Union Horizon 2020 research project called IMAGE. IMAGE is a short version for innovative management of animal genetic resources. IMAGE generated numerous research results for improving cryoconservation programs. One of the deliverables of IMAGE 
was an assessment of the previous FAO guidelines on crowd conservation and the proposal of contents for an updated version. Scientists from Image partner institutions served as co-authors of the new guidelines, with gu authors from each chapter being matched with the authors from non image scientists to ensure a global perspective. And then scientists from the Nordic Genetic Resources Center, also known as Nordgen, served with me as co-editors of the document. Regarding its contents, it first starts with a chapter on developing a gene bank strategy, which is based on considering a cryoconservation goal, matching it in the context of the overall program for management of gen of genetic resources within the country, and also considering emphasizing the need to interact with stakeholders. Section two is on implementation organization, and in particular emphasizes quality management and adoption of quality management systems to improve the efficiency of gene banking and to satisfy clientele. Chapter three is on the choice of biological material, and talks about the choice of using semen, embryos, oocytes, and other types of cells for the different species. Section four is on economics of gene banking and looks at doing a cost benefit analysis to prepare gene banking collection strategies. Section five is on the developing and use of collections and looks at the numbers needed as well as the utilization of genomic approaches for management of gene bank collections. Section six gives details on procedures for cryoconservation of germplasm and tissue for different tissues in different species. Section seven is on sanitary issues because it's very important to ensure that we're not cryopreserving pathogens along with our our genetic resources. Section 8 is on databases and documentation. The information describing samples in a gene bank are nearly as important as the samples themselves. Section 9 is on legal issues because gene banking involves exchange of uh, genetic material among different owners. And in the case where these materials would cross country lines, then the Goya protocol may also be of importance. In section 10 is on capacity building and training for gene. With regard to genomic characterization, FAO has a long history of cooperation with the International Society of Genetic Resources, International Society for Animal Genetics, better known as ISAG. In fact, there is an ISAG FAO Advisory Group on Animal Genetic Diversity, which is the Standing Committee of ISA. Members of this advisory group have led the development of previous FAO guidelines. This started nearly 30 years ago with guidelines on the measurement of domestic animal diversity. In 2004, this group recommended a standardized set of microsatellite markers for several different species. And in 2011, Members of the group served as editors of the FAO guideline on molecular characterization of animal genetic resources. Following this trend, current and past members of the advisory group also served as editors for these new guidelines, and the authors were also generally members of ISA. As for the contents, these guidelines start with an introduction which gives a justification for genomic characterization and looks at the history and future prospects for, for molecular characterization of genetic resources. The next chapter is the basics, which goes over the upstream planning that is re required for a genomic characterization study. Chapter three is on genomic tools and methods and looks at aspects such as using SNP chips, genotyping by sequencing, whole genome sequencing and imputation of genomic data. It also is a step-by-step -step approaches for developing data for analysis. Section four is on the applications of genomics and gives an overview of the various methods and software 
for looking for estimating genetic diversity within population and then comparing genetic diversity across populations. It also reviews applications such as searching for selection signatures and genome-wide association studies. In addition to these chapters, there is also some main conclusions and recommendations, as well as appendices on specific topics. So in conclusion, animal genetic resources are important, global public good for food security. FAO members have an intergovernmental process for assessing the management of global animal genetic resources, which is guided by the Global Plan of Action for Animal Genetic Resources. FEO provides technical assistance to countries and monitors the status of animal genetic resources. FEO has recently produced two new guidelines, one on cryoconservation and another on genomic characterization. And they have been made available online since mid-January. The URL for these two guidelines are shown here, and this presentation will be shared among participants. With that, I'd like once again to thank the organizers and thank the participants for their attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for this wonderful presentation, introducing uh, to us the different guidelines that are newly uh, produced by the FAO and uh, uh, cloud conservations of animal genetic resources, uh, molecular characterizations, and this is a good support also for us. And uh, to ensure that what we'll be doing on the frail is really the right thing, and also to contribute building the capacities of uh, staff, technical staff on the field. And we really hope that uh, with uh, Paul Corrin's uh, position as a secretary of the Intergovernmental Technical Working Group for Animal Genetic Resources. This is within the genetic, uh, the Commission of Genetic Resources of the FAO. We should be able to really accelerate and support countries and regions to ensure that we have a sustainable conservation of animal genetic resources. So um, our next presenter is from Cambodia. This is uh, Fem from NAFRI, and Fem is currently uh, Vice Chief of the Animal Breeding and Genetic Lab, and uh, with his experience working on the uh, genomic, he has been working for a good time in Thailand also when he was focusing on gene expression profile, codifying for his stress and growth in different uh, Thai native chicken. And he's also, he has been with uh, NAFRI since uh, 2017, where he's supporting uh, bull frozen cement production and establishing a genomic lab unit uh, and uh, developing the equipment and facilities and training. And he's now working on also on the PhD program to uh, ensure, um, to study genetic structure of growth, fitness and resilient trait in local animal genetic resources in the Cambodia, and today he will be sharing with us uh, his, uh, uh, what he captured as local animal genetic resources in Southeast Asia. Please, at, uh, Femi, you have the floor. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and may I say good evening from Cambodia, because now, yes, uh, half past uh, uh, 17 in, uh, no, no, uh, 7 p, half past 7 p.m. in Cambodia. <laughs> okay, so it is today it's my pleasure to be a panelist for the uh, online video on regional strategies for biobanking of animal genetic resources in Asia. And it's also my pleasure to share uh, about animal genetic resources in Southeast Asia, case of poetry, cattle, and pigs. So, and I'm here today on behalf of uh, my uh, director, Dr. Tom Stira, as he has uh, his uh, uh, important task um, regarding uh, animal health topics. 
So here today of my presentations, so I will uh, describe about uh, mainly on external characteristic of Cambodian native uh, animal genetic resources. And before I go to the uh, detail of the main part of the presentation, let me uh, share you uh, uh, a brief about the description of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia regions. So here is uh, Southeast Asia that uh, the land area is uh, 4.5 million kilometers square. And the population is 675 uh, million. The border of Southeast Asia, uh, the north by uh, East Asia, west by South Asia, and Bay of Bengal is of Oceania and the Pacific Ocean, and South by Australia and the Indian Ocean. And here is uh, Cambodia maps that really located on very good um, uh, landscape of Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia climate is mainly a tropic uh, climate with plentiful of rainfall, except northern of Vietnam that uh, has a short term of cold layers. And in Southeast Asia, uh, some of the country used to be under colonization of China, Europe's countries, Japan, India, and America. And why I mentioned about colonization? Because uh, some, uh, because um, the colonization may really uh, affect uh, the local animal genetic resources. And the main religious of Southeast Asia mostly uh, is Islam and following by Buddhism, Christian, and other religious. According to the data from FAO, um, uh, around 60% uh, of the local overall biodiversity is unknown, mainly in developing countries. And according to this, uh, some of the species also under critical and also already extinct. Uh, just uh, capture you about the importance of livestock production in Southeast Asia or mainly for small our smallholder in Cambodia. Uh, the importance of uh, local livestock, mainly cattle, pig and chicken, really um, important for our daily life because in Southeast Asia, we still use uh, the cattle uh, as a truck power, transportation, and all pig, cattle, and egg is a, so a good source of protein that provide meat, meal, and eggs. And it's especially for the poor family to get uh, protein consumption. Uh, more than as an organic fertilizer from the manual, uh, livestock production really um, uh, maintain the uh, soil quality and it contribute to recover the soil erosion uh, for agricultural uh, production, all type of crops. And uh, livestock production is a source of capital in uh, uh, income generations, and mainly it uh, raises the value of the women. Um, because livestock, um, because the women can raise livestock and the activity during livestock production, it does not affect uh, the gender's capacities. Livestock provides uh, the material for daily life, like clothes uh, and other materials. And in Southeast Asia, it's really important because livestock represent our culture and social activity. And especially in Cambodia, uh, the people always connect our daily life to the livestock, like uh, cattle raising, uh, cock fighting, and we also please um, the pig and chicken to our uh, ancestor or of God. And it's really important to keep livestock uh, to be important and to keep it until uh, until now. Oh. So today, as I mentioned earlier, I will uh, uh, share you the information of uh, native animal resources in Cambodia that based uh, mainly in chicken, pig, and cattle. 
So according to the reference, according to the references, so there are a, a referencing a brief that name by the existing information. So here's the description of the brief and the meaning of each brief. It referred to uh, our, I think, uh, I do believe that around the world, uh, especially in developing countries, uh, the people, the local people name their uh, animal uh, breed based on the um, external characteristic. So uh, likely in Cambodia, so each meaning of the breed, uh, here's the meaning that they are really based on the external characteristic. Like here's, they refer to rectangle fall and here's, it's a large body size, so it the name as the ceiling seat. And here it has bare fitter, so the name based on the fitter. And here also based on the fitter type. And here also the based on the fitter type. Except for the last one, it referred to fighting cock. And here the special characteristic of Avanetti chickens that we have a yellow skin. And we have uh, the dominant one is yellow, um, same color and white colors. And, but now we are like, we are in the admixture population level due to and purpose of uh, conservation or the breed of establishment of a proper breeding program. And here I, I mean like uh, about the black plumage feature that our local uh, people always uh, need it for to please our the uh, uh, deity or god because black feature represent the uh, evil god so that's why the this black feature is main one is really important for for our local people according to the research by FAO so uh, regardless of the name of the breed um, the characteristic of quantitative trait, uh, mainly in body weight and strength length. Our uh, local uh, populations uh, were different in different agroecological zones. Like here, you see that uh, the body weight and the strength length are significantly different between coastal, central plain, and highland area. So according to my uh, synthetic uh, article, there is a connection between genetic and phenotypic characteristic, not likely uh, the name of the chickens. And both phenotypic and genetic characteristic uh, illustrated different rank in different agroecological zones. So even though we have egg reference breeds, but they are just different based on the external characteristic, but maybe and another quantitative traits, they are, they say are the same uh, group of um, uh, genetic resources. But uh, they are really uh, interesting uh, study by uh, Nishiburi et al. 2006 that our Cambodian uh, native chicken resources, they are the similar frequency of external characteristic to those in Southeast Asia, uh, namely uh, mainly Thai, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, and Malaysia, except the black plumage color that uh, we are slightly higher than, and also uh, the uh, heterozygote of a wild type and black plumage color also high to those in Southeast Asia. And this confirmed by the recent study by Rene Al 2022 that Cambodian uh, chicken population has very high diversity and we have uh, uh, highest numbers of allele comparing to uh, our neighboring country in Southeast Asia. So let me move to uh, the external characteristic of our native peak. So according to the reference briefs from the existing information from our uh, uh, previous researchers and also from the local um, knowledge. There are uh, five main breeds, uh, five main breeds of, of our local pigs. Like here's the name and here's the 
the meaning of the name. Uh, similar to chickens, the name of the local hall breed uh, refer to the external characteristic and the body size and the characteristic of uh, the face and the ears. And here is uh, the uh, uh, um, important characteristic of our local pigs. So we have uh, a red type that small size and uh, a small ear and straight face. And here's the breed. And here is our local breed as well. The name is similar to this one, but it has a coat color similar to the wild pig. But the researcher mentioned that it's not a wild pig, it's already a local pig already. And here is uh, the characteristic that's similar to uh, Hainan spread that we also found in Cambodia with the uh, Y, um, how do we, Y um, uh, uh, belly, Y belly, yes. And here is another spread, but now the spread we could not see anymore. It's called uh, Dombray, Dombray means elephants. Has a medium body size and a yeah, look, and also face resemble of the elephant, but we could not see it anymore right now. So here is the photo done by myself. That uh, because uh, when I did my bachelor degree, I did the experiment with the local pig in one region of Cambodia. So here is the. A different ethnol characteristic of our local pigs that it's not different from the previous one. So most of, of them has a small body size, a straight face and straight short ears, and also the uh, coat color black, um, uh, wild type, uh, white belly, and uh, we don't have a, a pendulum back. Most of them has a straight back. But uh, it is confirmed by uh, the group of researchers again in 2006 that this one is very um, a special characteristic of our local peak uh, countrywide because it is done uh, countrywide. So all of them has uh, like in number two, uh, in number two, it has a, it called a black pig with white belly. It's a, uh, Hainan's uh, breed type. And number three and number four, uh, the black local pig, uh, local pigs with wide legs and horizontal uh, ears. Uh, sorry, not car ears. And number five, uh, the white short ear pig with uh, black spots because we have black spot on the uh, coat colors. And number one and number six, uh, it is the black short ear pigs number one and number six, it's similar to the previous one that I already um, uh, saw uh, on the previous slide. And number seven, it is a uh, wild types local pig that it has an acuity sort a pig with black spot. And let me move to uh, the external characteristic of the locality cattle. So according to the uh, existing information and also the document that I can um, uh, found also the local knowledge. So there are one, uh, there are two type of um, really like um, uh, local. There are, you can say that a pure native breed. If one is called Go Kandokalat, I mean a Go Kandam, and Go Knum, and this one is really our specific specific local type. And we can see the picture here. Here is the uh, characteristic or the picture of the first one. It is called uh, the Gondol Gondolat or, or Kokadam. It means red or crab. It refers to the uh, small body size like red and uh, so, uh, uh, short uh, straight ear. And crab, it refers to the color of the crabs that it's similar to our local cattle. And we still can find here uh, at the uh, roof wall areas country wise. But I will show you later, I will show you later with the uh, next slide uh, what is the importance of this bridge, or uh, what is the uh, uh, special point of this bridge. 
And another type is called copenum. It means uh, mountainous cattle. Uh, this type is really a pure local breed as well, but we could not find it anymore because mountainous cattle, it has a, a medium size or big size, a range from around 300 to 500 kilo, kilograms. Uh, most um, uh, big cattle uh, can be found at the mountainous area and mostly our local farmer use it for Pluffing and uh, pluffing or for transportation. Due to the uh, modernization of the agricultural machinery, so that's why uh, this breed could not, uh, it rare now in Cambodia. Another type is cross breed. So there are two types of cross breed. It's called a cross breed and white cross breed uh, capital. So uh, around uh, in uh, 19th centuries, Cambodian uh, uh, bring the breed, uh, Indian breed to Cambodian with the uh, 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 segments, artificial segments, insemination, artificial insemination with a uh, segment from uh, India, that namely Brahman and Harijana. So most of uh, our local breeds uh, has this type of uh, color cross breed and white cross breed, and we can see uh, country by as well. Uh, mainly in the central plain and lower Mekong regions. But our local people also name it like we call for color crossbreed, we call uh, Golang or Tlok, that refer to uh, the uh, large or medium size of the cattle with gray, white, yellow, and pale yellow or black colors. And we have another type of crossbreed, it is white crossbreed, and we name it. Uh, it means river cattle that we can find along the river of the Lesap and Mekong rivers. And this one is uh, specifically uh, white colors. And until now we have uh, uh, Brahman and Haryana as well. And uh, it really 100% uh, similar to the original breeds of Brahman and Haryana. So here is the uh, difference of uh, our local breed. So here is, as I mentioned earlier, that we have uh, this type of cattle countrywide, but um, from my uh, study or from my research, like we have different uh, coat color, like the, the cattle in the mountainous area, uh, the coat color is a bit uh, slight red, but uh, in, uh, uh, lower uh, lower uh, Mekong regions, uh, the color of the cattle is quite uh, uh, red. Uh, yes, the, the, the red color is stronger than uh, in mountainous area. And here is the picture of a, a crossbreed cattle. And here is the picture of uh, we could not say a pure Brahman, but it, they are really like a pure Brahman in Cambodia. And it's very interesting uh, by my personal study. It just uh, not um, a 100% a, a uh, standard uh, uh, analysis, but I done it at IAAFBO in Austria. So it found that uh, this, this cattle uh, really uh, uh, high diversity uh, because it's very high in heterozygote allele and also number of allele also highs. But the genetic distance between the breeds is they are not um, so uh, uh, different except for Brahman comparing to local uh, reds and local white. Uh, they also the study by uh, the group of research in 2006 that there's five uh, characteristic of our local cattle. Here is the mountainous cattle that bring to uh, uh, Swat Chahau in Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. And uh, letter B is a, a typical uh, native cattle uh, yellow, uh, with the color yellow brown, and it represents in northeastern of Cambodia. And here's the bull of Indian breeds. And here also the a, a specific characteristic of our local cat thought that it resembles the hybrid of Bantangs and local cat 
that we also found in northeastern of Cambodians. And here is a male hybrid between Bantang and, cat and local cattle at uh, Phnom Tamal Zoo of Cambodians, of Cambodians uh, National Zoo. So as you mentioned, as you know that the foundation of genetics is affected by a genetic factor and environment and environmental factor. So our local genetic resources are really affected by uh, the um, animal migration factor because every day the commercial uh, breed imported to Cambodia both uh, all type of uh, like cattle, like chickens, or like pig on the on um, um, with the commercial um, business, and really important uh, that with the crossbreed as well, uh, a lot of insemination, a lot of artificial insemination done by uh, bringing uh, the commercial uh, breed segment to inseminate with our local animal. Uh, especially uh, the cattle. And another factor is about uh, breed selection that the not only cattle or all type of our local livestock pig, cattle and chicken um, uh, that can be survived until now due to the human preference. The breed that uh, has good market demands uh, has may uh, have a uh, large percent uh, in the country. Like example, um, uh, the yellow uh, skin or the yellow shank of the native chickens, the consumer really um, uh, distinguish or identify the native breed uh, when they see the yellow shank or yellow skin of the chickens. And uh, for the pig as well, uh, uh, they really want the local pig for uh, roasted uh, pork because roasted pork has very good market in Cambodia now. So they really want the local type because the local type has uh, tasty uh, meat. And the cattle as well, uh, the local cattle uh, uh, really easy to manage because they are resistant to internal parasites and uh, infect the disease. And also the small body size of the local cattle also good for uh, our um, menu as well because in Cambodia, people also uh, uh, ha uh, consume a roasted, um, roasted uh, calf. So local cattle really fit to this type of business. That's why our local resources uh, really affected or can be maintained until now due to the uh, pre-selection that based on the preference of the market. It doesn't mean like we have the pre-selection program yet in Cambodia. So another factor is the genetic tree factor. Like in Cambodia, as we can see, like uh, we have a lot of bad events regarding uh, infectious disease, like avian influenza, uh, outbreak, and uh, African swine fever, especially African fever, really affected our local pig populations because uh, it really happened with the uh, uh, major uh, impacts in the country wise. But until now, we can. Now we can manage already, but when it happened, it really affected to our local uh, populations. Uh, another factor regarding genetic drift, it, uh, it referred to the uh, uh, land. Um, okay, I, I think uh, I, I would not say about it. Uh, it's really interesting about uh, the local genetic resources in Cambodia because in this regions, in this region northeastern of Cambodia, and we can see uh, uh, the local genetic resources of chicken, pig, and cattle, because most of them are local. Uh, lo they are a minor ethnicity uh, group, so they raise a bit far from the capital city, and then uh, they can uh, keep or they can maintain the local uh, genetic resources better than the area that close to the development zones. 
so challenges to um, conservation of our local genetic resources in Cambodia, I think similar to another developing Southeast Asia countries. So we lack of uh, exit to conservation station and breeding station. Uh, it, we lack of skill and facility in in-situ conservation. We have uh, the policy to support the local uh, genetic or to improve the local genetics uh, of animals, but we really need a fully support fund and we need to see the action that uh, Cambodian can uh, conserve uh, those type of original breeds. Uh, we really need uh, our local people or other related stakeholder to understand, to care about this um, uh, matter. So we need ongoing program, ongoing training and extension programs. Uh, we need uh, to establish conservation and breeding programs in countries. And to be done this, we really need uh, the international agency support because international agency support like every or gallery or Rosalind Institute really uh, um, uh, uh, like uh, have done a lot of good work with another country. And we do believe that international agency can uh, move us uh, to achieve the exit to or institute conservation of our genetic resources. We could not say about the climate change uh, factor because climate change really affects the biodiversity, uh, especially the livestock. So climate change also the challenges to conserve, conserve our local genetic resources. So here the reference for my today presentation and thank you for your kind attention and I'm happy for any questions from all the participants. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, for that very informative presentations on the different breed of uh, poultry, uh, pig, and cattle. And you know, with uh, Tropical Poultry Genetic Solution, which is already having some activities in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Myanmar, this is a very good resource to ensure that we are really targeting what is key on the ground. The same will happen with the African and Asian dairy genetic gain for the breeds of cattle that you have presented and on which uh, uh, population rely mostly for their daily nutrition, et cetera. And also for the whole CG, seeing what is coming from the pig and pig diversity and where we can, how we can conserve them. So this is really very important. And we hope in collaboration with uh, Ilaris, Roslyn and FAO, applying the different tools, we should be able to support the country in the crowd conservations and sustainable development of these uh, animal genetic resources. Thank you very much. Our next presenter, uh, we have uh, Professor Cook, who accepted uh, graciously to give us a talk on the state of conservation of poultry genetic resources in Vietnam. Prof, are you there? Christian, so we have a few questions in the question answer box. So uh, can we answer now or we wait to the question answer sessions? We can go to the question answer sessions before we, we take all the questions at once to manage our time efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I, still have, I still have time or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good uh... Evening, everyone. Can I share the man the screen, please? Yes, please. You can share your screen. Mm. This one. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we see it now. 
you can put it on presentation mode. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Go, for accepting to make this uh, presentation on very short notice. And uh, we are sure we'll learn a lot from you. Prof uh, is uh, Vice Director General of National Institute of Animal Science in Vietnam. And she is responsible for international cooperation, animal biotechnologies, uh, national breeding and genetic program, and biosecurity for food safety. And she has also been working with uh, as a national coordinator for the domestic animal resources in Vietnam and in collaborating with a lot of institutions as consultants. So, Prof, thank you very much, and uh, you have the floor. Yeah, okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. So, um, good afternoon, good evening, every uh, participants. So, uh, so have you- uh, if Please, you know can you put your presentation mode? It's still not- uh, Okay. Yeah. Is it, I think now it's better. So if you can, uh, if you already know that, that we have, uh, now we have a total population is 90, almost 99 million people. And, uh, uh, and in Vietnam, we as uh, intro in, uh, we are agricultural country. So with uh, agriculture uh, consists of 18%, in which 70% uh, population is based on agriculture. And agriculture contributes about 18% uh, GDP, uh, in which animal production consists about 26.5% uh, in agriculture production. And in which the contribution of animal production was about 5% uh, of GDP. And now I will talk uh, very briefly on state of conservation of poultry genetic resources in Vietnam. So if you, you can uh, see here uh, that we are very diversified in um, animal genetic resources, including pig, chickens, the buffalo, and all of the uh, animal distributed through Vietnam. And you can see that Vietnam is a very long country and in with chickens at also located, most of the chicken located in the north of Vietnam and very few chicken is located in the south of Vietnam. And um, or they all also uh, located in the center of Vietnam. So now if you look at the total, uh, the total populations, total breeds of uh, Vietnamese uh, local breeds. You can see here that uh, the chicken we have about thirty breeds, uh, following by um, uh, following by duck with the nine breeds, and uh, here and also uh, if we look at the pig, we also have twenty four big breeds. So in Vietnam, most of the animal we keep that is a chickens and pig. So now, if we look at the uh, livestock populations that we can see here for the poultry, uh, we have uh, 525 million uh, chickens and the total population, uh, population trend now is increasing. So it means that, that more people, they keep the chickens uh, during the day. And for the pig, we have only 20, um, uh, 23 millions uh, pigs and uh, very, very little buffalo and cattle compared to poultry and pig. So now what is the status of the Vietnamese local breeds? So you can see here that we have about uh, 21 breeds is in the critical uh, status and nine breeds and eight breeds now is uh, in in dangers, and we also have one breed already extinction. And um, with the normal breed, we have about 60 breeds with now they are increasing or they are uh, 
uh, developing a lot uh, and uh, um, many uh, breeds, this breed keep in the farm. So now if we look at the conservation program, so uh, from 1990, Vietnamese government, they will also focus on the conservation program at the national level. And um, that they call the national program for animals and resources conservation with the one supported by Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. And the second one also very big program uh, is started for a long time ago. I think that is already 12 years already. That is a national program uh, on exploitations and use of animal genetic resources. This one is funded by Ministry of Science and Technology. And uh, besides its uh, two big programs, uh, at the province level, they also have a local program for animal genetic resources conservation. So uh, in total, we have a three programs to conserve the animal or the poultry genetic resources at the different level and with a different funding. So now for the conservation program, what, uh, what we do, that is we do institute, institute conservation. In this one, we uh, start to keep the live animal in the place where it come from. And we also bring it to the station uh, to record the productivity, to keep the genetic resources. And for the extensive conservation for the chicken, we have not yet done. In Vietnam, most of the extensive conservation we are doing mainly focus on pig. And on pig, we conserve the somatic cell. This one is funded by FAO project two years ago. And uh, we uh, uh, keep the uh, uh, DNA of pig. This one is we also funded by um, the uh, Japanese government through the uh, Zika projects, Zika projects. And we also keep semen, we also keep the OSIS in cooperation with the uh, Japan's uh, government. And now, now we also very successful in pig cloning. Uh, well, this technology we can manage very well. So um, I think that for the conservation, if we look at the XC2 conservations, the chicken we have not yet done, but the pig conservation we do a lot of activities. So now, if we look at the genetic diversity of Vietnamese local chickens uh, in the context of global uh, context, so we uh, this uh, result is done in Germany, and when I do my PhD, and we include um, the thirteen Vietnamese local chickens and. Uh, uh, more than 50 um, chicken breeds come from the different uh, productions and also uh, production in uh, different continents. So if we can see here that if Vietnamese local chicken have uh, uh, cluster very close to the rest younger fowl, uh, it, it, this result is so meaning that it could be the Vietnamese have a high diversity compared to another chicken breed come from the different continent and different production system. So if you can see here, you can see uh, that the Africans, uh, this one is the Africans that in breed, chicken breed is in between, and this one is European breed, is really um, clutched with the different uh, branches. And this one is a Chinese breed, and which is very close to Vietnamese uh, chicken breed and also for red ring fowl. So from this result, uh, we can see that. Mm, we can see that the Vietnamese local chicken, it could be, uh, um, uh, we can see the result that the Vietnam, it could be the domestic Cajun plate areas of the chicken. So therefore we will also continue to research on another marker 
to see the origin um, to see the origin from the Vietnamese chicken compared to another breed. So we can see with mtDNA chicken uh, analysis, and we we also see that Vietnamese local chicken is class into the different class, which is uh, assume that. Um, come uh, that assumes that the domestication bread uh, bled. So it means that the Vietnamese, it means that Vietnam is also one domestication of, uh, of the chicken over the world. So, so then we look at the conservation potential and extinction property based on similar. Uh, at all 2000 and uh, 2000. So we can see uh, in this one that we estimate the conservation potential and extinction pro property based on the, the um, genetic diversity and based on the um, uh, uh, social and the economic factors. So we, we also can found that um, the Vietnamese local chicken have a high uh, genetic diversity, and we also find out that uh, uh, two breeds uh, have a higher extinction. And when we uh, combine the um, extinction probability uh, together with expected diversity to estimate the conservation potential, then we can see that um, two chicken, one is this one, uh, that is a chicken, and this one is a chicken, and um, the other three, uh, the third one that don't have chicken, this one they have a, a high conservation potential. So from this result, we assume that if the national uh, policy will have a very low or very few the basis to conserve the chicken, weak one, it should be put in conserve. Mm, to keep maximize genetic diversity of the uh, national total genetic diversity of the chicken in Vietnam. So if we can see here uh, that this the that chicken, this one is uh, very low leg and uh, Dong Tao chicken and a chicken, three chicken breed is it should be uh, conserved. And so therefore that is the result we already um, uh, we already danced together with the German partner uh, in 2010. Uh, and here is uh, some pictures of Vietnamese local chicken breeds. Uh, and so we also have a duck breed. So, the, so mainly I think that uh, for the um, uh, poultry conservation in Vietnam, if we look at the institute conservation, we can do a lot of things from 1990 until now. We all the way continue to conserve the, the chicken population if they have a limitations of the number. Um, but uh, for the cryo conservations of Vietnamese poultry chicken, we have not yet done it due to. I think that due to the budget is very uh, limited. Uh, and um, of course, the, the osis or the embryo uh, conservation is need very high technology. And we uh, we support to, to apply this method uh, to conserve the uh, poultry, chickens, and the resources in Vietnam. Um, we can do on the in the past. We can conserve the uh, the stem cell. Uh, we can conserve the uh, semen. We can conserve the embryo or uh, all size uh, from pig. That one is supported uh, by FAO or supported from Japan, uh, from JICA uh, project and Japanese government. Um, uh, but for the chicken, we have not yet get the support. So I hope that for in this project, we can support Vietnam to apply the technology to conserve, uh, to create, uh, conserve the, uh, the poultry genetic uh, the resources in Vietnam. So that is uh, all the, my uh, presentation.
for today. And thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. And that is uh, wonderful, trying, uh, telling us exactly where we need to go in terms of prioritizations and uh, uh, of genetic resources, poultry, as we mentioned, uh, is still to start for the crop preservation. And this is what I think uh, Rosling Institute, Ilori, CTHH, and the TPGS, we, together with you, should be putting in some effort to make sure that uh, we also advance with uh, this uh, poultry conservation of this poultry genetic uh, resources. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Wanda, at this level of the presentation, is it possible to take one or two questions before we move to the next presenter? Um, yes, uh, Christian, but I think the presenter, especially Femi, is answering his questions. I don't uh, know if those people who are uh, raising the question have already seen them, but he's already doing it. Okay, good. By text, yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof, for that presentation. And I think the query you are raising on the conservations of poultry genetic resources using the stem cells is what is going to be shared by uh, June from Rosling Institute. June, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you very much. So while June is sharing his screen, uh, mm -hmm. let me introduce him. He's a researcher, he's a scientist at the Rosley Institute at the University of Edinburgh, mm -hmm. where he obtained his PhD. And he has broad knowledge on research experience in and research experience in avian immunology and virology. And he specialized in biobanking of uh, avian species using primordial gene cells. And is the lab, which uh, has efficiently established biobanking system, which involves freezing, cultural PGC, and embryonic reproductive tissue, and transferring the crowd preserved primordial germ cells to the genetically engineered sterile surrogate host with uh, uh, Mike Macro in, in the Mike Macro's team. So the indigenous PGC in this uh, ECA space non surrogate host can be ablated. Uh, it means through injections, we can obtain 100% for donor primordial germ cell transmission. And this system can either be uh, male or female birth and surrogate host and cut the time and number of birth required for gener to the generate pure progeny when restoring the crowd conserve material. So thank you very much, June, for accepting to make these presentations and to bring more light and more guidance to where we need to go in the Southeast Asia regarding poultry biobanking using the stem cell technology. Please, June, you have the floor. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I will give you from uh, Rosalind. Uh, my sound is okay. That echo, is that okay? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about, uh, about banking hidden species. So crowd preservation is a hidden species is very highly demanded in several uh, aspects, including the commercial breeding company, and also, I mentioned earlier, uh, talks uh, for the indigenous breed and also the research line. And also, we hope these uh, knowledge and uh, skills extend to the wild animal. So, typically, typically uh, county maintain the uh, uh, avian species just the life. So, because uh, for preserve the eggs are difficult and freezing semen for a short time is okay. For long term, it's called a problem. You can see here, this picture is shows that before the freezing, uh, the semen samples, we see the few uh, dead sperms showing red. After freezing, more red cells, dead cells appear in the semen samples. In one of our experiments, we freeze down the dozens of the embryo lines uh, after freezing the chest, the fertility of the semen, 
you can see some point we get a good fertility rate to 50%. But for some breed, uh, for some line, you can see very poor fertility, just 0%. Bring back the pure chicken breed from the uh, Semen, a free the semen samples that take uh, almost 10 generations breeding. That's a need uh, almost five years to do that. So that is a time consuming uh, task. So, uh, preservation of the primordial germ cells look like it is an attractive new method for back in the species. So, here show what is a uh, primordial uh, germ cell. PGC. Uh, PGC presents the uh, blossom when the delay. So, and then they migrate when the embryo develops. Here, so there's a picture of the uh, PGC. They label with the GLP uh, uh, label. So, they come from a uh, 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 GLP uh, reporter as just. So when the uh, vessel is formed, and then the PGC migrates along the blood vessel. So here the movie shows the green PGC migrates along the blood vessel. And then eventually they reach to their destination gonad. So you can see their site uh, beside gonad as well. Here, and then the numbers expanded. I can see more cells in the uh, embryo brain and then cells uh, at the uh, seven embryos. So, how to preserve you can use on the PGC? The typical method that uh, grows the uh, PGC is from the blastophase or from the circulating blood. You take one half liter of blood and then. This Please. is a uh, PGC, this material is not known, so you have to grow them. John, John, so, Please, can you, yeah, can you adjust a bit your microphone? It seems as the quality of audio is reducing a bit. Okay, okay, let's, I don't know what's happening, why is that um, echo? Maybe I should turn down my... You don't stop sharing anything. Maybe you can. Yeah, you can share again now. Yeah, we can see your screen. But we can't hear you. John, we cannot hear you. Can someone hear June? I lost the voice from my end. No, I could not hear. I, I can't hear him as well. Uh, uh, he he unmuted, or he un, he uh, he muted. So please unmute him. Uh, um, uh, 
or maybe he has a uh, internet connection problems because he could not hear our voice talks as well. Let me unmute him. Now, can, is that okay now you can hear me? Yes, very good, thank you. Sorry, sorry, so it looks like you missed a lot of the information, oh, sorry. So, I don't know where you missed it. So, there's, there's a new technology, we, the new hypothesis we just think to freeze down the latest stage of the embryo gonad because this uh, gonad have uh, 10,000 PGCs already. If it freeze down this uh, material directly, that will bring down the cost and also because that's easy to handle. So that will be easy to use. And also because that is not pouched, so that will, bring, uh, will be a low risk for the genetic mutation. And then when we freeze down the tissues, we can put multiple uh, genotypes in one valve. And then we want to bring, uh, bring back the freezing bridge. And then we can introduce uh, uh, gonadal germ cells into the uh, sterile surrogate host. And then we can bring back the new bridge. So that's our hypothesis. And then we want to prove it. And then we use the uh, uh, Rothman's uh, uh, pathogenic uh, JFE and RFP embryos, and then we use the uh, D9 embryos because D9 embryos will because uh, we can uh, differentiate the sex by the uh, gonad morphology. So based on this information, we can mix mix uh, individual sex into the separate well, uh, separate tubes, and then we mix uh, five GFP, uh, five pairs of the GFP gonads with the uh, one pair of the RFP. We just want to see the low abundance of the germ cells, whether or not they can transmit, uh, evenly transmit in their offspring. And this, this is uh, our freezing strategy. And then when we, uh, once we want to bring back the chicken, and then we saw the tissues, and then we dissociate the cells from the gonad. For the male cells, we just the dissociate cells and directly inject the cells into the uh, surrogate host. However, for the female cells, before injection, we use the uh, max sorting to purify the germ cells and then do the injection. Once we've done the injection and then we incubate the eggs for several days, and then we afterward, we check the, the uh, donor cells uh, uh, col uh, look, uh, uh, colonization in the host, once we're happy with all the condition, and then we hatch the injected eggs, and then we uh, grow the hatchling until the sex mature, and then we breed the surrogate host between the male and female that will produce a pure offspring. And then based on you know their uh, genotype, uh, phenotype, either red or green, we can see the the, the uh, the germline transmission. So here I show the video. This is our technique for the micro-injection because this is very important. Good micro-inject techniques will uh, increase the uh, uh, injected availability of the injected embryos and also will be good for the hatchability. So we put the dye into the cell suspension and then through the dorsal iota, we inject the uh, cells into the surrogate holes, and then we seal the windows and then put them until hatch. So another important thing is the sterile host, as I mentioned earlier, because you, you have a surrogate host that will be much more efficient to bring back your freezing uh, uh, chicken breed. Uh, for the sterile host, we, we generate a uh, 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 a pathogenic nine called the icaspase nine. So it's here it's show for this uh, for this uh, transgenic nine. If we put the uh, BB uh, a chemical inducers, so the the endogenous uh, uh, PGCs will be induced apoptosis will kill the, the endogenous PGC. So you can see this picture shows uh, without uh, BB chemicals, we can see the PGC showing uh, green spots. Is here when we put the BB uh, chemicals into the uh, embryos, you can see all the uh, endogenous PGCs are disappear. And then we want to check 
uh, the frozen uh, gonadal germs, uh, whether or not they can colonize into the surrogate host very well. Here is shows uh, the, the uh, male cells in the male uh, surrogate host, and here shows the uh, female cells in the female surrogate host. We inject, uh, we inject the GRP and RIP cells, so we can see the uh, green cells and red cell colonize very well. And also we uh, we inject low number of the RIP cells, so you can see the low number of the uh, donor cells growing the host very well as well. So one uh, next we need to check the uh, frozen uh, germ cell whether or not they transmit to the offspring, and then we did the four injections, four injections including two male tissues and two separate female tissues, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, for the female cells, we didn't do the purification, just a uh, mix of uh, cells. For the uh, female cells, we use uh, max sorted cells. So we use a higher number of the uh, unsorted cells and uh, uh, thousand cells for the sorted cells. All the tissues in the cold storage over uh, either almost three months or over three months. So we can see the good uh, inject techniques, you know, you, we can uh, get the uh, good uh, variability of the injected embryos and also the hatchability because the first time the first injection, the hatchability was low. And then we improved the uh, incubate, incubation condition. And then the, the, the hatchability was uh, increased dramatic, dramatically. And then we get the enough numbers of the surrogate hosts. So that is, uh, we did the injection and we did the hatch and then we uh, grew the uh, hatching to the sex material and then we breed the surrogate, surrogate male with the surrogate females. And this, uh, this table shows the, 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 the uh, egg productivity from the surrogate host. We can say uh, in two uh, cohorts of the hands, one uh, cohort of the hands gets a 6.3 uh, eggs per hand per week. The maximum is seven. So another is five eggs per hand per week. So all these uh, eggs, are, uh, fertility are good over 80%. We didn't, as we expected, we didn't see any uh, indigenous uh, 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 offspring from the uh, surrogate host. And then we also checked the hatchability. And uh, we did one hatching and see uh, as we can see here, the so hatching was very good. The hatchability is, is over 90%. We didn't see, again, we didn't see any transmission from uh, endogenous uh, PGCs. So here show all the offspring. We can differentiate the offspring. Uh, we can see the, the, the uh, transmission from their phenotype, either green or red, or here shows the yellow because it come, uh, that demonstrates the genes come from both parents. So the chicks are very healthy, you can see here. And also we demonstrate our uh, uh, crop preservation method in, in the different uh, breeding, uh, different chicken line. Here so we here show the uh, Inber line, line N, and also La Sussex. So you can see the surrogate uh, parents, they are the brown uh, feather color. They are offspring, as a pure offspring, they are the white feather color. So they are similar to their control. That is uh, from uh, natural uh, parents. And also you can see like Sussex, they have a, a unique uh, a feather pattern as their neck. So it's the same to the control birds. So we have started to crop preserve the uh, Rosin research chicken line, uh, including a uh, Inbra line, and and also we have some uh, research line like like uh, La Sussex, Rhode Island, and G line, and also we have a uh, lot of the research transgenic uh, line. So we start to use our method to crop preserve this uh, chicken. Line. So our stories has has reported in the Poultry, uh, Poultry World web website. If you are interested, you can take a look at uh, this uh, report. And uh, I would like to uh, thank all the people listed here and also the founders, especially the CTLGH and the NC3Rs. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh...
June for the wonderful presentations, and I'm sure he's bringing more light and uh, to the query that uh, Prof. Ko was already raising on conservation of poultry in the Vietnam and Southeast Asia in general, or Asia in general. So thank you very much. And uh, we will really be counting on your support from Rosling and from Mike Macro team for the activities. And of course, uh, Tropical Poultry Genetic Solution to support the Southeast Asia team in the conservations of the uh, local genetic resources that we saw earlier. Thank you, thank you, June. And now we are moving to the next presenter, Tom. Tom Bodden. Hi. Okay. So I start, yes. start video. Um, start video. Start yes. Video. Right. So I'll share screen. Yeah, you can share your screen, Tom. Yeah. So Tom is a group leader. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Very well. Yeah, just a minute to introduce Tom to the team. Tom is group leader at the, in the Division of Functional Genetics at the Rosling Institute, where he established his lab since 2002, if I'm, I'm true, and investigating the control of growth and differentiation of embryo-derived stem cells, and his lab research uh, interest center on the uh, regulations of growth and differentiation of pluripotent stem cells and also elucidating new mechanisms that control uh, cell renewals and pluripotency and uh, currently his team is uh, continuing this basic work and extending their work to developing novel stem cell system for directed differentiation and functional analysis of genetic variations in livestock and wildlife storm is having very good interest in the local pig genetic resources and wild pig as well, and on cattle, tropical cattle, etc. So Tom will share with us uh, uh, his skills and expertise and how we can use that to support conservations in the in tropical areas in general. Please, Tom, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, let me know if there's any problem. Uh, with hearing me or uh, my slides. Okay. Yeah, so well, far, so good. Very okay. Well. So far, so good. Good. Um, so um, I can move my slide possibly. So you can see the next slide. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah. So thank you for the invitation to talk here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really uh, give an overview of what we've been doing in the lab um, and how it might relate to the ideas of conservation of uh, wild animals in particular, but our project in our lab has really started with the notion, or I would say in the last five, six years, we've concentrated on trying to uh, establish cell culture systems for studying livestock biology, basically, in a dish, what we call livestock in a dish. And what this slide illustrates is really how we've started off with domesticated species, but more recently have been also extending this to uh, developing cell culture systems for wild animals as well. And so the whole idea behind this is that we can basically establish cells culture systems as surrogates for studying the biology of, of these animals and look at particular cell types. And an array of those types of cells are shown there down below the, the fic sort of fictional tissue culture dishes. So why would we want to do this? Well, it, the reason for doing this really is that we're interested in two aspects or really one is doing interesting and new science because we think that livestock and also wild animals are really a very interesting resource um, not only just looking at the genetics but also the actual physiology or molecular biology or biochemistry of these animals but also ultimately we would like to also uh, have a way of impacting on the conservation of particularly wild animals and indigenous um, domesticated species. But so far, the work that we've done in the lab is really concentrated on the science rather than conservation, I should say. So the science um, that we're interested in is really whether this cell culture systems and comparing across species, whether we can gain insights into animal health to look at disease, for example, 
whether we can use these comparisons to improve livestock productivity, uh, whether understanding the genetics might give us insights to some of the important things that are changing in our environment in terms of climate change, for example, or the kind of pressures that have been put on domesticated species through domestication. And ultimately, although this is slightly further down the line for us compared with the chicken work that you've just heard about, um, we would like to think about using this kind of system as a way of conservation of species ultimately, uh, uh, generate a living archive of genetic diversity. Okay, so our system really is based on trying to uh, get access to live cells. So although the genetics, of course, is fascinating and comparing the genetics of various species is interesting, having the live cells gives you a, a great deal more power because you can actually ask questions about what the gene function might be. So the typical way we would work is we get a live tissue biopsy. We grow out some primary cells, usually they're fibroblasts. But the problem with these live cultures is that although we can bank them, we can freeze them down, as shown here, this culture here, um, we can archive them. The trouble is that these primary cultures have limited lifespan. They also exhibit limited functions because they're only from one cell type, for example, a fibroblast. And genetic manipulation of them is quite difficult because they don't have extended lifespan. So the way we've approached this is really using our, our background in pluripotent stem cells. And we've engaged the power of pluripotency, essentially. So this is uh, sort of an old fashioned slide, I would guess. Basically, this is uh, work that was established about 30 or 40 years ago, where essentially you could take a mouse or a rat potentially, you can get the embryo from those animals, and then you can outgrow this little cluster of cells here, which is called the epiblast, out in culture and create stable cell lines of these cells. And these cells are essentially the founder pluripotent stem cells of the embryo. They give rise to every other cell type in the fetus. And the power of these cells is that they grow indefinitely and they grow indefinitely without transformation. You don't need to, they have no con constitutive con oncogene activation. They are conditionally immortal, essentially. And when they lose their immortality is when they differentiate. So basically, if you put them in the right conditions, you can differentiate them into almost any cell type you like. So basically, you have this power of unlimited expansion of the stem cells combined with differentiation of the cells. Okay. So for mouse and lab animals, this is, um, and even for humans to some extent, this is a relatively easy thing. For livestock, you can still get all access to embryos. But this process of generating pluripotent cells was revolutionized in 2006 when Yamanaka discovered a way of directly reprogramming adult cells back to a pluripotent embryonic state in a process called IPS reprogramming. So basically, we've adopted this, as many people have. You can take a tissue biopsy, establish a primary culture, and then using this IPS reprogramming technology you can generate pluripotent cell lines that are called IPS cell lines. And they behave essentially very similar to stem cells, embryonic derived pluripotent stem cells, in that they grow unendingly, unlimited, or are immortal, and then they differentiate into a whole variety of differentiated cell types. So basically, this is the system that we've been applying to a number of livestock and wild uh, cells, wild animal cells, I should say, focusing primarily on pigs. And uh, I'll, I'll describe a bit more of that, that now. So this is just an example of a real world example of, of what we've done. So we got some skin cells or skin fibroblast cells from uh, th this animal here called Red River Hog, which is normally found in Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, actually, yes, uh, in, in the forests. And we established fibroblast cultures from these cells, from this animal. Now, I should say, this was a biopsy. The animal was still live and running around. It's, you can still find this animal in, uh, in Brazil, actually. Um, so the fibroblast cultures were generated in the lab. And then we reprogram into stem cell, into an IPS cell-like state. And then we, gen we could basically demonstrate that these cells were pluripotent, i.e. had differentiation potential, because we could convert them into a whole variety of different types of cells. So these are just representative of the type of cells that we've been able to generate. And the one that might be interested for conservation, although we haven't done it very efficiently so far, is 
um, germ cell like cells, which we can generate from these types of cells. Okay, so uh, just to give you some example of the functionality of these cells. So th those little videos just show you there uh, some heart cell that's spontaneously formed in the differentiations that we've done in the culture. And also this video on the right here is actually some macrophages that we generate routinely in the lab, which are just going turning red because they're gobbling up fluorescent beads, yeast um, beads, showing that these cells can generate very functional, fairly normal um, somatic cell types. Okay, so how have we applied this? So we've got a uh, sort of ma main project at the moment in the lab where we're interested in seeing whether we can use this technology to understand something about an important, uh, commercially important and uh, I guess ethically important disease and that's African swine fever virus. So um, as most of you probably know, the African swine fever virus is endemic in sub-Saharan Africa and it's tolerated infects these uh, warthogs and other bush pigs and other uh, wild African pigs, but is when, when it infects a domesticated pig or domestic pig uh, or a wild boar, it kills them within a week. So we're interested in why it is that the warthog can tolerate this, whereas the domestic pig is killed by the ASF. And so the approach that we're taking, and I'm just summarizing um, wh where we are going really with this work, is that we've taken iPS cells from susceptible hosts, such as pig. We've taken, we're making iPS cells from warthog. So we can generate these cells in, 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 the, in the lab. We can freeze them down. They're basically, we can send them across the world, can do anything we like with them because they're basically immortal now. And basically with a sort of 14 to 21 day protocol, we can generate macrophages with them. And then we can send them to SAPO4 containment labs where we, they can be infected by ASF feed. And that's what we've done. And we're interested in how well the cells are infected, the cell responses, and how, uh, how the, basically the genetics of those animals confers uh, disease resistance. OK, so just in summary, um, then uh, really we are, I guess, pursuing some aspects of understanding the science, uh, the biology of these different animals, basically doing, doing it by creating in vitro systems. We're using the stem cells really as a bankable resource, which we can basically dip into at, at will and generate a variety of different cell types. And ultimately, I guess in the future, uh, as has been demonstrated by a number of labs more recently in terms of um, looking at things like the white uh, I think the southern white rhino, people have got indications of germ cell differentiation from iPS cells. So we think there is also potential for developing strategies for generating germ cells from these stem cells in vitro and potentially using them as a conservation tool. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And... Uh... Yes, wonderful seeing what is uh, being done and what can be done to support conservations in the, this part of the world. And uh, something wonderful on hearing about the, these immortal cells and how we can uh, manipulate them to support not only conservation, but also uh, development of animal, uh, healthy animals to booster the production in Africa in general or in Asia, where these, uh, in Africa, particularly where the Africa swan fever is a very uh, little dangerous disease, and now also spreading around the world. So it is very important to ensure that we have these uh, sustainable genetic resources. Please, uh, Musa and uh, Wande, any question? I can see June has raised the hand. June, Musa, Wande, any questions from your end? No, uh, not from my side. At the moment, uh, Christian, if there is anybody with a question from the uh, other members, they can just put up their hands and turn on their speakers. Do you want to turn June's microphone on? Yeah. June microphone, is it? Yeah, it's on now, I think. 
June, are you getting us? Yeah, 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 I'm here, yeah. Okay, I can see your hands up. No, 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 I, no, I didn't. Oh, no. okay, okay. Sorry, I yes. didn't, no. Any questions from the, from the participants? I, yes, I, I see some question uh, asked for my presentation, but I already answered with writing, but if some point not yet uh, clarify, so please raise it again. Yeah, maybe can I, can I add on that one, Christian? Yes, please. Yeah, um, well, part of it, <clears throat> the question was, was also mine. Of course, Chaiti also raised the question. You know, with this uh, Asian Chicken Genetic Gains Project, uh, we have also worked in Cambodia. And what we found was only eight ecotypes, which, uh, you know, FEM raised earlier. So we had this question within our, among our team members that we still couldn't, I mean, totally take it or understand how come that, you know, Cambodia, uh, con considering the location in Southeast Asia would only have eight ecotypes. Of course, um, Fem said there are 28 ecotypes. Maybe it would be good for him to shed you know, light on that issue a bit in detail would be good, uh, you know, for, for our understanding. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, Fen? Let me share the screen for to easier to answer the question. Uh, so I uh, guess actually uh, something uh, confused. Uh, I mentioned about 28 populations for the current study. So it doesn't mean 28 ecotype. So the egg ecotype that I presented, uh, it mean like the name that named by our local people, named by the existing references. So the question, if they are present until now, or if they are more than that, exactly if, um, because there is no the um, exact study. So I hope that the project of HG chicken uh, from Ilri maybe can understand this because the DNA of the chicken can reveal that how many haplotypes that uh, the current population um, uh, they separated each other. So the current study done by one of our colleagues, so Dr. Renzo Thierry, uh, maybe you know her already. So, uh, but uh, regarding the methodology of sample collection, but according to her study, so there are uh, seven clades of the uh, chicken, Cambodian chicken population. So I have until uh, uh, A, B, uh, C, D, E, and J. So, uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven clades. So they separated to be seven clades. And it really admixture population level, you can see. So uh, we, have, we don't have a breeding program. So that will find the, the breeds twice at admixture level. So, it is the answer that we could not say that how many are there now in Cambodian chicken population. Okay. I hope I hope you got the point, or if it's not clear, we can discuss. There's a question from uh, Mike. I don't know if Mike wants to ask it himself, or you can go with the typed one. Again, please. Yes, uh, Fen, there is a question. Does the usefulness of the fibroblast or uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells biobanking ultimately depends on being able to clone animal from these cells or learning to differentiate into gametes? Um, I think the questions will also be addressed to, to Tom. No, mostly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, should we maybe do that at the end? <laughs> it seems to be a bit rude doing it in the middle of somebody else's presentation. Or Yeah. I mean, 
what do you think, Christian? I mean, I can I can talk I can answer that question if you want. But yeah, uh, please. It yeah. seems. Oh, you want me to answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I don't know. Is that from Mike McGrew? Yes, it's coming from Mike. Okay. Yeah, of course. The quality of the IPS cells is critical um, for for anything involving germline, so I, or cloning. So that's absolutely correct, and that is one of the big uh, challenges. Um, I mean, of course, this technology has been applied in mouse. So you can make a single, you can make, you can take a single iPS cell and create a whole mouse out of it. So that tells you that the quality is very high. And people have now made quite significant progress in, in generating gametes in mm. from mice and, and getting fertile and basically live born pups from uh, in vitro derived gametes. Um, so all this is possible. The trouble is it's a lot harder in, in bigger animals. And it's also a lot harder in animals where uh, the access to the reproductive biology is a lot more complicated. So yeah. it's, it, it's, it's possible, but it will probably take some time in the future, I would imagine. Yeah, and we hope with time and uh, continuous exploration the different techniques in science, we should be able to uh, reach that level of to facilitate at least the differentiations into gamete that will still be supporting, restoring uh, livestock and wildlife, wherever we are. We have another question, please. Uh, Musa, can you take that? Can you read that for the panelists? Yeah, so uh, this is, I think it's from Olivia and I don't know whether it, okay. So very recent, no cattle before the European intro. I think this is a follow up to a question Olivia had asked before. Oh yeah. Uh, and it was about the origin of the cattle in Cam of the taurin in Cambodia. And I think there was an answer and I think it's just trying to confirm that. So there is no recent cattle before the European introduction. I don't know if that can be just a yes or a no answer to that question. I'm trying to find what the original question was. Yeah, so Olivia had asked uh, Fem, I think he has his hands up, so maybe I just let him talk. Fem, you can go ahead, I will. So I, I have just, written. I have two questions for uh, either um, June or Tom regarding stem cell technology for poetry or for uh, mammal. So, uh, do you want, uh, sorry, fam, do you want to comment on Olivier's uh, follow up to your answer about the origin of the cattle in Cambodia? Okay. I, I think it was just confirming that the, the samples are not from. Uh, okay. can, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, Olivia, yeah. I'll, I'll just let you go on with that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, sorry. No, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. I really enjoy your presentation. Now, I, I indeed asked the question, what was the origin of the Cambodian torrent cattle? And you kindly answer that they basically come from importation from Europe, uh, both live animal and semen. So my follow-up question was that, but sounds strange, but obviously I'm not, uh, I might not be aware of the situation, that there were no cattle before the European. So maybe they were just banting cattle or were there already some uh, Bostorus cattle at the time before European introduced uh, the animal or simply there were no cattle. Uh, thank you. Okay, it's a very interesting question. I just confirm what I understand from the, the taurine, I refer to the uh, milk cattle, right? Dairy cattle, or uh, you okay. ask in general, is it? Yeah, I was thinking about the, your indigenous cattle that you were mentioning. You ah. know, you, uh, you mentioned the mountain cattle, and I think if I'm quite, one of them was the mountain cattle, and there was some, another one which I forgot the name now. And then you obviously mentioned the crossbred, and then you mentioned the indicus. So it just, uh, I was just curious. Uh, uh, okay, uh, okay. I, I got the point. I got the point. So I, what I, <laughs> I confused with the uh, dairy cattle. So for our indigenous cattle, it is a type of both angicus. So the look, the indigenous one really uh, um, uh, evolved in our uh, land of K 
Kingdom of Cambodia, and it really uh, related to uh, the Bantangs and uh, the Kopre. Because in Cambodia, it really uh, important um, uh, topics regarding uh, 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 cattle because we have Kopre species that it doesn't have very well on it. Uh, on the world, over the world. So, did you know Kopre? Did you hear about Kopre? Yeah, sure. Kopre, yeah, Kopre, Bantangs, and indigenous cattle. Okay. And then I have another question, if you allow me, you know, that I have the floor, and I will be very please, brief. Please. But, but I was curious about your presentation on chicken. You have obviously a very uh, large diversity on the matter on the Aldeni, but you also have... Uh, 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 you also present some data that there were some phenotypic difference uh, between actually uh, uh, three population of chicken in the three different agroecology. Uh, and uh, so my question is, is that if you have to prioritize uh, uh, the ex situ conservation approach for your chicken, uh, taking simply uh, chicken from these three agroecology, uh, will that also uh, uh, represent uh, uh, the mitochondrial diversity uh, of the uh, uh, local Cam uh, Cambodian cattle or oh, sorry, Cambodian chicken? Or do you have to do more than just taking sample from this three population? Over. Uh, to me, um, I think we have to collect countrywide to be um, uh, accuracy, more accuracy, and then we will a uh, group or uh, we will pull uh, the population based on the agroecological uh, zone or based on the regional regions or uh, based on again pull the data based on the external characteristic and uh, pull the data based on the uh, name of the local people that it already uh, everyone understand it or everyone know it as a breed. And it should be uh, applied to all chicken, cattle, and pigs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Olivier, and thank you, Finn, for that uh, wonderful contribution. Um, any other question? Musa, no. Uh, no, I think Fem had a question. So if you can continue with this question now. Okay. <laughs> okay. I have a question for, uh, regarding uh, stem cell. So to us as a developing country, we uh, we really concerned about conserve the stem cell in uh, nitrogens or even the in refrigerator uh, minus 80, I'm not sure. So regarding it, we will spend a lot of money to uh, preserve them, preserve the stem cell. And also, uh, it really, uh, stem cell is uh, last technology to uh, develop the livestock uh, production, but uh, it's going to spend more uh, and to support uh, the technology. And for us, we really hesitate to adopt uh, this technology. So how do you suggest us, or how do you, uh, what is what your lesson learned experience in another countries? Yeah, so I guess that's you. June, uh, do you take that question? Yes. Uh, well, I only can answer the questions for the PGCs. Yeah. So the, for the PGCs, actually, like uh, I talked about, uh, culture the method is slightly uh, difficult for some uh, developing countries because this is need long-term training. And uh, so that's why we developed a very uh, simple method, just try to uh, dissect and also freeze down the uh, embryonic gonad because that's the uh, tissue has enough uh, PGCs, you can, you know, fr uh, car preserve the chicken breed. And uh, the rest of the method, yeah, well, it exactly needs, um, uh, you know, needs a uh, training, uh, you know, practical training. So that's uh, why, you know, for our uh, NC3R at the moment, we got uh, extra funding. That's a small amount of funding. 
and then that uh, encourage us to uh, you know go to like uh, Africa or China to training the people. They have this uh, uh, demand for the crop preserve the chick chicken species. So if you have this uh, demand, maybe yeah. Well, if you have yeah, so probably we can either can go to. Africa or somewhere we you can get the practical training. So that I think this method is easy to adapt it. If you see the the, the minus eighty freezer, so that is difficult for long term storage. So at the moment we use uh, either one hundred uh, minus one hundred fifty freezer or use the liquid nitrogen for long term storage. So I think probably. This is need, you know, government funding or some kind of funding to get to set up, a, you know, the basic facility to storage long term storage. Actually, this uh, storage storage based on our calculation is uh, cheaper than your livestock, actually. So that's much cheaper than your livestock. That was I understand for this uh, question. Is that did I answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jun. And uh, allow me just to add to that, that uh, in fact, that is the essence of having these regional webinars to also ensure that we can pull all the effort together. We may not be having uh, individual uh, platform for biobanking in each of the 10 ASEAN countries and having uh, individual facilities everywhere. We need that. How do we pull our effort all together to ensure that if China or Cambodia or Vietnam is having the facilities, we can bring all the scientists interested in conservation in one locations, have them train, have them have effective uh, hands on scale on biobanking and make sure that at the regional level, we have that conservation happening. And as June mentioned, it is in fact cheaper. If you go, when, if you go through the recent paper uh, June published and the others on the low cost uh, cow conservation, you will really see that it is affordable. With the GONAD, it is much more easier. And with minimal training, we should be able to buy a bank within the regions. Of course, we were supposed to have uh, one of the, our last presenter, which I also have an issue on the movement of genetic material and compliance to the access and benefit sharing. We'll have that later, but with facilities, let's say we have facility in Vietnam, we can bring people from Myanmar, from Cambodia, from uh, Laos and the Philippines, et cetera, to have effective training on crowd preserving what is priority in each of the countries. We pulled it, we have it done, and gradually while well, we are upgrading the equipment in the countries, we can restore uh, the population. So um, then there is no, uh, wor not too much worry about that. And this is the essence of having these webinars to make sure that we bring all the expertise and the knowledge discussion, our heads together to have it done. Okay, thank you, Christian, for more elaborations. Thank you. Um, we have already any other questions? I don't think so. And uh, probably uh, Musa would like to just say in one minute uh, what he's having as idea regarding uh, the cattle stem cells platform that these regional uh, webinars and contact with people from Southeast Asia can allow us to build and really have access to that material that will support development of locally, local and locally adapted animal genetic resources. Musa, is it possible for you just to share a few ideas on what the stem cells platform can help to do? Oh, I, I think. Uh... Uh, Tom would be uh, most uh, directly uh, linked to this uh, scenario, but I think one of the things we are trying to develop within the, uh, particularly within the CTLGH, is to find animals that are resistant to, although at the moment it's currently uh, based on 
uh, previous CTLGH projects such as ECF tolerance, but we the hope is to include other phenotypes that are relevant to tropical livestock health. And one of the things is some of these animal resources or, or breeds are not necessarily restricted to the regions where CTLGH is currently actively operating in. And if I say this is mainly within what we have, for example, the resources available in Ilri or in Roslyn. So one of the things I think that, and this is the platform that Tom is trying to generate, to generate all this IPC derived cell line through which we can then try to probe some of the biological processes and understand some of the things we are finding from either genetic studies or epidemiological assays. Now, one of the things that would be useful is if some of these materials can be sourced also. Now, I know that will involve a lot of things, but until we identify them and we know they exist, then you can start thinking about the processes of whether it's possible or not. And, and, and I think, uh, and I will let Tom comment on this, if he will, the, the ability to kind of, for example, he gave you a good example there of working on ASF tolerant, uh, tolerance in pigs. I think if we can get a pig breeds or resources from yes, uh, Asia that they can use to generate cell lines from those kind of pigs rather than say, for example, using wild uh, pigs, you know, that might be of use to 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 a platform like that. So, Tom, if you will, if you find I have anything to add on that, it will be appreciated. Yeah, thanks, Musa. Yeah, I um, I'm still stinging from Mike McGrew's comment. Um, yeah, I think uh, access to these different pigs is really interesting and. Sorry, I don't know if I'm going to really answer your question, Musa, or follow on sensibly, but um, I mean, I think that being able to test the cells in the, in the case of ASF against macrophages generated in vitro from local breeds of pigs in Cambodia or whatever, or wild pigs, such as the, the warty pigs and, and others that are potentially going to be at risk from ASF. Be. Um, I think this is really actually quite interesting and could have some important direct um, impact on conservation, uh, understanding what the resilience or resistance is. Um, yeah. If that's what if, if that's what you were after, that's what that's certainly something. That, the main problem for us is two two things. One is getting access to the the samples and collaborating, uh, and this is not trivial because of Nagoya. Yeah because the technology that we're developing, and we don't think it's perfect by any means, um, but we're keen on making it much better so that we can more reliably generate these stem cell lines. Because one of the issues with generating iPS cells is actually the quality of the cells that we start with is rather important. So of course, sometimes you don't have control over that. So having a more robust protocol uh, is extremely useful, but that is actually something very useful that we're developing ourselves, as well as the actual primary cells that we need to then reprogram. So I think it must be more, more seen as a collaboration between the technology that we're developing and access to the primary cultures. I think it, once we can get that working in sort of synchrony, things will take off and move much faster. But at the moment, the difficulty is getting access to the cells. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. As I said, the first thing is to know what the resources are available. And the next question is how to get if you you want them. I guess back to 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 Mike, if he's still on here, I think the other point from this is, can you uh, use actually those resources, either starting from IPAC, and I know he asked that question, can you biobank those as a, as part of this biobanking uh, process? If if I don't know whether that needs to come from a specific cell type, uh, Mike probably want to chip in on that. What what he had in mind when he asked that question? Well, no, I think I think what he was saying was um, quite right, which is that you know in terms of conservation, yeah, you know ultimately you want to generate gametes really. That's what, or animals, cloned animals. And that's absolutely right. The question is, you know, 
and there are two things really. One is, can we learn some, can we actually archive the material that we get straight away? And that is that you can do just as Jun described, you can freeze down mashed up bits of tissue. So that means that you have that animal or at least in live cells. Archiving live cells is critical because then we can do something with them. Freezing them um, and killing the cells is no good to anybody. So it's being able to freeze live cells means you've got something in the freezer, even if it's a primary cell or a bit of tissue, something can be done with that in terms of generating a stem cell. The other thing, which is of course critical for all of this conservation work is the environment. Saving the environment is the most critical thing in all of this for the animals. Yeah. Uh, Christian, I don't know if uh, the other members uh, who have presented can either see how some of these, for example, the the IPSC platform can be of use to them. Yeah, we really want to hear also from Prof Cook how you see it supporting biobanking and revival or restorations of genetic resources in the Vietnam. Okay, Prof is muted. Okay. Okay, there is uh, maybe he's having an issue with his mic or whatever. But we have uh, someone raising the hand from the attendance. We have uh, Kate. Can I allow him to talk? Yes. Thanks for giving me the floor. I don't know if you are hearing me. Yeah. You have, you have volume is, can you improve or come closer to your mic? I was saying thank you, Prof, for giving me the floor. Yeah. I had uh, submitted a question um, in the chat that wasn't answered. So I would like to have some insights on it. And the question goes to us, in light of the limited resources and competing priorities, how can regional ball banking strategies most effectively balance the often divergent needs and interests of different stakeholders, including national governments, local communities, and private sectors? So in summary is how can, how can ball banking be implemented more efficiently in, uh, in countries where it has not really been having an efficient output. For example, my country, uh, Cameroon, which is not really a case for Asia, as we've mostly been talking about Asia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me say something before whoever wants to take, uh, while waiting for whoever to take uh, the floor. So the, one of the things and uh, is our capacity to uh, pull the effort together in countries with low resource, small or little limited resources. And I think that is one of the reasons why we are taking the regional approach of these uh, kind of uh, webinars and discussions to see exactly what we have at uh, within the regions, who is there to support and how can it be done. And the second thing is also being able to establish uh, our pro to determine our priorities from what we saw. We may not have all the resources to crop preserve whatever we want, but we can start with, from somewhere by prioritizing. And you see from the Prof. Google presentation, how they identify what they thought was uh, where to start. So we can start with that and pulling all the resources, we should be able to at least to contribute and taking into consideration what uh, we call uh, uh, farmers prefer breed or co community prefers breed, for example. Some another aspect is what is community preferred may not be scientifically always relevant. So we need also to discuss within the regions with scientists to see is that a trait 
uh, is that threat that we want to crack preserve or the which is in a brief to crack preserve is it really important to support the regional poultry value chain developments or what so we need to adjust our priorities and see exactly what is standing at the right middle and start with it because we will never have facilities to develop everything but we need to start from somewhere within a regions take into consideration availability of human resources of infrastructures and uh, who we want to collaborate with and uh, i think uh, uh, tom and uh, musa mentioned the issue of access it will be very important for us also at the regional levels or at the country levels to facilitate access to genetic resources that will really help us to determine what is priority, what is relevant for the countries and for the value chain that we want to develop. So that is important. And that's why in the next presentation, the future presentations, maybe in the regions, we should also be putting emphasis on the collaboration for compliance to access and benefit sharing of the Nagoya protocol within the countries. So uh, that is what I wanted to, uh, to, to contribute to the question you asked. I don't know if there is any other thing coming. Kate, is that OK? Yeah. OK, Prof. Thank you very much. I'll take a Thank note you. of what you said. Okay. I think uh, we are already... Yes, please. Sorry, the, the, I don't know if you're getting that, but there was a question, I think, still pending on the queue, and I don't know if it was answered or... or let me just find... Uh, there was... Uh, I can't see it now. I don't know if you can go to the Q and A. There is a question there that. Uh, oh yeah, so I I found it. So someone is asking. It's anonymous, so I can't tell them to turn on. And so they're asking in Vietnam, how can in situ and ex situ means be compared to, be compared in regards to their conservations, for both livestock and poultry. Um, I'm not sure I understand this. Maybe the uh, I don't know if the, the the person who asked the question can clarify. Yeah, but I think what they're asking is whether in situ. No, yeah, probably they need to clarify if they can clarify the question. But I think it's about using the. I don't think it's it's for for conservation purposes. I don't know who that question would be relevant for, but they can clarify what the question is first of all yeah otherwise we'll just continue with the sorry okay no go ahead please or oh, i think uh, the person wanted to ask how we can compare the in situ and the ex situ for conservation, I think the approach is maybe different and the advantages also are different. So now it depends on what we want to do and where we want to go with our uh, poultry or cattle, uh, livestock genetic resources in general. But we know that for ex situ, of course, in the very small space, we can conserve large number of animal genetic resource for very long time. So, and we should be able to revive it anytime you want, provided we have the resources to keep the facility running for that time. While we know that in the in situ, of course, we can crossbreed, but we have the risk of any emergency happening at any time and wiping all, all the genetic material we are having, or we can be creating while conserving, moving toward, uh, let's say, kind of inbreeding, which at the ends, we are losing some genes because we are really not moving toward what uh, may be needed in the future generations. So the advantage of ex situ conservation is that at any time we can screen the material again and identify 
what may be needed to introduce in the current poultry or the livestock breeding programs and revive the trade or revive the, the breed that we want. So I don't know if I'm bringing more light to what, or if I'm even asking, responding to the questions, but this was just to try to compare with few words, uh, ex situ and uh, in situ, in terms of advantages, of course. None is to be discarded, but we need to look at the advantage of technologies being developed. So as we said from the beginning, this webinar is uh, preparatory to the regional well lab training that we'll be having in the regions. And uh, this, we are starting now with the uh, Southeast Asia, Asia in general. And the next webinar will be in the East Africa with the uh, people from the livestock and the genetic groups in the regions. So from here, we should be able to get back to all of the attendants and those who registered to be able to uh, ensure that we are well prepared in collaboration with TPGS or with ADDG to have the regional well lab trainings. So I'm sure that from there, uh, um, Prof. Tadele, Olivier, uh, one day and others should really support us and Prof. Cook here. Prof. Cook will continue supporting us to ensure that we have those trainings in the regions. And uh, we'll get back to you later for the practical modalities. So I think we are already 30 minutes after five from here in uh, Nairobi. Thank you very much to everyone who attended and we will still be relying on your support to make sure that the stem cell platform will be supporting livestock developments and that the national partners should be really giving access also through compliance to the ABS, to genetic material, that Tom, that Musa, that June, and uh, Mike, and everybody will need to really effectively, uh, to, to effectively, um, efficiently support the countries in developing their conservations and uh, livestock agendas. Thank you very much to all.